Well, uh, thank you all for tuning in. My name is uh, Ben Bellarado and I'm the laboratory manager here at Crow Canyon Archaeological Center. And we just really want to uh, express our gratitude for uh, everybody tuning in to this next webinar that we have today with Dr. Ed Jolie. And this webinar this evening is sponsored by the Saxonon chapter of the Colorado Archaeological Society uh, and is part of the Four Corners lecture series. And the title of Ed's presentation is going to be Basket Weaving in the Mesa Verde Tradition. So I'm going to go through a couple introductory slides here before I turn it over to Ed. So again, I just want to thank all of our viewers. You really make a difference. Uh, Crow Canyon is a nonprofit organization uh, located in Cortez, Colorado. And we are really grateful for your interest and ongoing support of Crow Canyon's webinar series. We've been uh, conducting this series for a little over a year um, and it's been incredibly uh, successful and we've been able to really conduct a lot of outreach and uh, present ongoing research that people around the world really are, are putting together and, and really deliver that to a very broad audience. I want to talk a little bit about Zoom. <clears throat> of course this evening uh, we're presenting from Zoom uh, but then also there's a live presentation that is showing up on Facebook. Uh, most of us, or many of us, I should say, have been using Zoom quite intensively for about a year now. And, uh, but I want to, in case you're not familiar, I want to give you a little bit of uh, tidbits that might help with the access to the presentation. So you might be seeing myself and, and Dr. Jolie here as little squares uh, in the upper right or some part of your screen, and you can move us around. Uh, so you can take that box and you can drag it to a different place. You can make it bigger or larger. Oh, wow, look, it's like the Muppet Show. Um, and you can, really, you can really move things around. So make it easy for yourself. Uh, we, there is also a live transcription service that's part of this. And I've noticed that it does pretty darn well at uh, decoding most of our archaeological jargon, but it does have problem with Native American place names, uh, some of the more technical jargon, so, um, but it's a really helpful service. And so if you have any type of auditory issues or um, uh, just, you know, might wanna turn off my voice, you can, you can read this aloud uh, and you can see what is actively being uh, presented. There's also gonna be a question and answer uh, portion of this presentation. And so in the bottom part of your screen, and if you're looking at the Zoom, you should be able to see the Q and A box and you can click on that. And as Dr. Jolie is giving his presentation, you can type in questions, um, uh, hopefully very pertinent to what he's actually presenting. Uh, you don't necessarily need to ask him about his favorite vacation spot. But, um, and then at the end of the presentation, uh, we'll be asking him some of those questions. So Taylor Hasbrook, who's uh, just the guru of these webinars, she'll be on right now. And myself will be basically compiling these questions. So at the end, we'll have a uh, some to ask uh, Dr. Jolie, assuming we have time. Uh, so let's see here. And if you're having difficulties, you can head over to our live stream service. Uh, again, it's at crowcanyon.org slash Facebook. So you can watch this on Facebook. It's a little less interactive, but it is, uh, it's live, so you can see the whole thing. Um, and then you can also subscribe to us on uh, YouTube. Uh, this presentation will be uploaded onto YouTube probably tomorrow. And so if you missed the opportunity to see Dr. Jolie talk about uh, basketry, uh, you can tune in tomorrow and, and in the future and see both this and all the previous webinars that we've put together. So I encourage you to do that because there's a lot of really great material. So like I said, um, this is part of the Crow Canyon webinar series and Crow Canyon is a nonprofit research education uh, institution in Cortez, Colorado, and our mission is to empower present and future generations by making the human past accessible and relevant through archaeological research, experiential education, and American Indian knowledge. And you can visit our website at crowcanyon.org for more information, or come visit us down in, in Cortez. So Crow Canyon Archaeological Center acknowledges the Pueblo, Ute, Paiute, Diné and Hickory Apache people on whose traditional homelands this institution sits and upon which uh, we work and reside. Our mission related work would not be possible without 
Indigenous people in the past, present, and future. We respectfully recognize and honor ancestral and descendant Indigenous communities for their contributions to all humankind. Crow Canyon is grateful to all Indigenous people and supports the preservation and protection of cultural traditions, ancestral connections, and sacred lands. And land acknowledgements like this have become rather popular in, in, in the recent, uh, uh, of recent. And, you know, we, we run the risk of, of kind of just reading through these. And we really want to emphasize that it's important um, to think about the people that currently and in the past and hopefully in the future live and reside on these lands that, that we all live on. Um, in, in North America in particular. So um, it's kind of a point where we can do some little bit of an introspection on, on where we're coming from and, and the, uh, the advantages that we have today. So uh, some upcoming webinars that we have uh, next week and the week after. The next week we have a jaunt through time, a cultural context of Southeastern Utah with uh, my friend and colleague, Lydia DeHaven of the Monticello Field Office of the Bureau of Land Management. And she'll be talking at 4 p.m. on April 22nd, so next Thursday. And then uh, the following Thursday, we have Beyond Maize, Beans and Squash with Dr. Michael Mathiewicz. And that'll be Thursday, April 29th at 4 p.m. And if you um, were around about a month ago, uh, we, Dr. Mathiewicz tried to give the same presentation and there were some technical difficulties, I guess. Um, but so if you missed that opportunity to see him, Tune in on um, the 29th and you'll be able to see that incredible presentation. So we wanna <clears throat> remind our viewers, um, you know, we've all had a really tough time this last year with uh, uh, the ongoing pandemic um, and other, other issues. Um, but you, you know, and so I wanna say, you know, indigenous nations, indigenous uh, communities have been hit especially hard. Uh, but you can make a difference, and we encourage you to do so. Uh, we have several different organizations that we'd like to uh, uh, bring people's attention to and where you could potentially uh, send some funds and, and really make a difference. So uh, first of all, we have the Pueblo Relief Fund, uh, the Hopi Relief Fund, the Navajo and Hopi Families COVID Relief Fund, and then the official Navajo Nation COVID-19 Relief Fund. And you can return to this, uh, this page on the, on the recording uh, to find these websites if you're interested in, in helping out indigenous communities in the, in the area. Or if you're tuning in from somewhere further afield, uh, you can also look for places more near you that where you could, you could uh, donate your help. <clears throat> so, um, at this point, I want to introduce Dr. Ed Jolie, and he'll be again. I'll be he'll be talking about basket weaving in the Mesa Verde tradition. Um, and uh, this webinar again is sponsored by the Hisatsunum uh, chapter of the Colorado Archaeological Society and the Four Corners Lecture Series. So, uh, my friend and colleague, Dr. Ed Jolie, is is an assistant professor at Mercyhurst University in Erie, Pennsylvania. And with Ed's background and research interests, he teaches courses focused on plants and people, Native Americans and contemporary society, and anthropological ethics. Dr. Jolie is also the director of the Perishable Artifact Laboratory, which is one of a, only a handful of labs around the world that specializes in the documentation and analysis of perishable materials such as textiles, baskets, nets, and footwear. And he'll be talking about some of that this evening. Um, and his lab receives perishable artifacts from not just the US, but all over the world, and including Mexico and Peru right now. And um, I just found out recently uh, that uh, this summer, Dr. Jolie and his family will be moving to Tucson, Arizona, where he's gonna be the new Clara Lee Tanner Associate Curator of Ethnology at the Arizona State Museum. Um, and he'll be at the University of Arizona and he'll be teaching uh, classes at the University of Arizona School of Anthropology this fall. So we're really excited about that. I'm a little jealous because I just graduated from there and I really would have loved to have been able to take some classes from, from Ed. Um, so his scholarly interests include the archeology span of the Americas, particularly in the US and the US Southwest. Um, he's interested in the past, the present and perishable material uh, globally. He's a Native American anthropologist and let's see here, there's a, oh, so much I can tell you about it. Um, what should I say? Uh, 
But so because of his mixed Ogallala Sioux, or sorry, Ogallala Lakota, which are also known as Sioux, and um, I'm probably going to mispronounce this, uh, but um, Holdugi Muscogee ancestry. Um, and he's an old enrolled citizen of the Muscogee uh, Creek Nation of Oklahoma. He strives to cultivate collaborative relationships and research partnerships with Native Americans and other descendant communities. Um, he has a lot of incredible publications in a number of different journals and uh, book chapters. And I just have to say Dr. Uh, Jolie's 2018 dissertation from the University of Arizona entitled, or sorry, the University of New Mexico, I'm going to try to claim that one there, um, entitled this Social Diversity in the Chaco System, AD 850 to 1140, an analysis of basketry technological style is an incredible piece of scholarship that you should try to check out if you have the chance. It was really influential in my own work and a number of uh, scholars in the region. Um, and, you know, Dr. Jolie is really one of the foremost experts in perishable technologies and basketry, not just in the US, US Southwest, but probably the North American continent. So uh, we're really in for a treat tonight. And so I'll finish up here and just say thank you so much for joining us, Ed. And uh, at this point, I'd like to have you go ahead and take it away. Thank you very much. I, I don't know how, how much blessing uh, shows up on Zoom, but that, those are very kind words, uh, and I, they mean a lot to me coming from you, Ben, so I, I appreciate that. Um, so uh, let me get started. Let me, I, I am Zoom proficient, or at least I, I claim to be in terms of how much teaching uh, the last year some of us have been doing on Zoom. So let's see, you should be seeing my screen. Let me start from the beginning. Okay, are we, does that look good? Yep, you can see the presenter mode and uh, and your your head in the little box. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Don't make sure I can get out. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, thank thank you guys for for having me. Uh, this is a, a real treat. As as they said, my name is Ed Jolie. Uh, I'm a faculty member in the Department of Anthropology here at Mercer University, teaching courses in anthropology uh, and uh, engaging in some field work and, and laboratory research projects as time and schedule permits. Um, I hope that this finds you all right now uh, safe and, and healthy. And uh, I am speaking to you from Erie, Pennsylvania, northwestern part of the state of Pennsylvania, a, a great city on lands traditionally occupied by the Erie's people, as well as their Seneca neighbors. And uh, over the, the, the past uh, several centuries, a, a number of other indigenous groups have passed the region. And I also want to point out, made very clear that they are uh, hosts themselves to their own uh, venerable traditions of textile and basketry manufacture. Um, and the great thing about doing what I do with, with this interest in baskets and textiles and like is um, I, I get to look at this stuff from all over. And so I, I get some, some insight and glimpses of, of how sophisticated and amazing uh, and ingenious people were in the past by, by looking at these technologies. So uh, one other final note or, or, or point I want to make is that there, there are no human remains on display, uh, no, no human remains in slides. And there are no objects, I've been very conscious about, not including objects that uh, come from, from burial context. However, um, there are objects that I illustrate that come from rooms that had burials in them, uh, but which weren't directly or clearly associated. So I, I have taken some effort there to make sure that there are no sort of explicit human remains or burial goods on, on illustration. Um, one of the things I want to do today that really the, the main goal is, I think, fairly simple and, and hopefully straightforward. And that's just to introduce you all to some of the formal and functional variation that we can see in ancient Mesa Verde basketry. And then also to sort of think about and consider how this material compares with some of the related industries from immediately adjacent areas. And, and talk about and think about how this illustrates how archaeologists define archaeologically discernible basket weaving or artifact stylistic traditions for a given area. Now, this isn't to imply, of course, that there was no interaction between areas, no sharing of technologies or ideas over these vast landscapes, um, but rather that alongside evidence for, for long-lived regional interaction, there are, are features, there are, are attributes of basketry and textiles related crafts that survive uh, in contemporary manufacturers and suggest not only a, a longevity, a, a venerable ancestor for these traditions, but also sometimes indicated a degree of similarity at a, at a regional geographic scale that suggests not only are they ancient, but they're ancient to specific areas, uh, particular places at particular times. Now, I also 
well, I, I won't promise because then I'll break it, but I, I'm going to do my best not to get too terminological or technical as I'm usually want to do when it comes to talking about baskets and textiles. But what I want to do is convey something about how archaeologists like me working with these materials, and I'm not the only one. Obviously, Dr. Bellarado, Dr. Webster, uh, Lynn Teague, uh, all these people who've come before me and done a lot of great work. There, there are a lot of other people out there working on this material, uh, and we're fortunate because there's so much to be done. But I want to kind of give a, a glimpse of how it is that we think about uh, assessing and evaluating some of these wider cultural and geographic affinities. When we, when we talk about you know, what is a Mesa Verde tradition? What does this mean in terms of understanding relationships within the, the Mesa Verde archeological region, but also in adjacent regions? And the reason why this is a, a big interesting concern for me is that as important as for us to address some of these fundamental questions about economy, you know, how people made a living on a day-to-day -day basis, I think we also want to be attentive to some of these bigger questions, these bigger anthropological questions that persist about human diversity. And I want us to be thinking about how it is that we can reasonably make those bridges, draw those inferences about how people lived successfully in the past. And living successfully, I think, from our perspective, can include how people lived alongside one another, um, how they did it cooperatively. And these are, I think, the fundamental questions that can yield lessons for us today about how we can live together, how we can learn from and respect one another, and how we can contribute knowledge that feeds contemporary innovation, gives strength, sustains our resilience as individuals and communities in challenging times. So my hope is that amidst all of these things, uh, it also provides a little bit of a reminder that many of these uh, ancient venerable traditions are not things that are, are old and lost or stuck in the past, but remain vibrant and very much alive in many communities today. So to begin, um, I think what I want to do is, is first unpack the talk in my title a little bit and provide some background and context in my research and the, the material I'll talk about. And then more or less, I'd like to engage a little bit of show and tell, uh, illustrating some examples of baskets and mats produced by the peoples of ancient Mesa Verde and adjacent regions, uh, largely to provide a sense of what we know people made and used, to, to give you a glimpse into that sort of quotidian day-to-day -day aspect of, of ancient lives. And I think the first place to start is really to, to kind of maybe unpack tradition. I, I, I titled the talk, Basket Weaving the Mesa Verde Tradition. So what do I mean by that? Well, we can think about tradition in, in a lot of different ways. And I think in general, most people have a, a, a common sense notion of what a tradition means, something with some longevity. Uh, something that is a, a practice. It might involve uh, lots of different behaviors or activities. In, in American archaeology, tradition tends to have a little bit narrower meaning, but still sort of overlaps with that, that more general understanding. Uh, tradition in archaeology generally refers to, to cultural patterns that are, are reflected in behaviors, often artifacts, uh, architectural styles, mortuary patterns, and also implies likewise that there's a, a degree of observed longevity, that they've been going on for a long time. The additional component of this is that often the recognition in archaeology of a tradition also tends to imply that there's a degree of cultural continuity, uh, that there, there is some consistency uh, that contributes to that longevity or, or is a part of that longevity. Now, that's not to say that obviously these things are um, occurred without chains or, or perturbations or you know population movement in the past, but rather we can uh, archaeologically get a sense that there are some things that, that appear to be very ancient, very old, that, that persist through time. And I, I think we can suggest that at least going back to, to basket maker times through the basketry of the Mesa Verde region. So that's what you see here with the map on the left. It's the archaeologically defined Mesa Verde region. Uh, again, you know, these are archaeologically drawn boundaries. They're not meant to suggest or imply cultural, biolo biological, or linguistic uniformity. But rather, we want to highlight that there, there are these, again, sort of archaeologically discernible patterns, these trends towards greater similarity in social and cultural form and, and economic patterns within these spatially bounded areas as, composed, excuse me, as compared to adjacent areas uh, where the contrast might be greater. And so um, you get a nice sense here for the geographic distribution across the four corners of the, the Mesa Verde archaeological region. A lot of what I'm going to show you and focus on is drawn from uh, materials recovered from Mesa Verde National Park, largely because that's the material I've, I've had the most access to uh, in recent years, as well as uh, I should also point out archaeological materials from, from Aztec Ruin, a, a Chaco and Outlier, uh, and then also, of course, some material from Chaco Canyon and a, a few other sites thrown into the mix. 
Mesa Verde obviously is a, a, a famous site. Uh, it's well known for its record of human use and, and habitation going back thousands of years. And I think arguably it's most famous for some of the, the really impressive cultural achievements that are on display in the archeological record and, and very visible today to visitors. Um, and rightly so. Uh, incredible developments brought about by people subsisting off of a, a corn, uh, maize-based agriculture and farming, and parallel developments that are manifested in their architecture, in their ceramics, uh, murals and rock art. And, and again, we wanna, we wanna add basketry and textiles and other products to this as well. So the point here is we're dealing with a, a naturally dry environment in this part of the, the Four Corners region. Um, and what this is, is conducive to preservation of organic material. It's a naturally dry environment that when coupled with some of these dry sheltered cliff sites and other localities, it contributes to good organic preservation. Um, it helps desiccate them, the low uh, ambient moisture in the air makes it easier for them to preserve and survive. And uh, for that reason, we are lucky enough to have access to these sort of rare glimpses or windows in the past perishable technologies. Um, a lot of the material that, that I'm gonna be showing you, particularly the material from Mesa Verde, uh, as far as we can tell, based on multiple other lines of evidence, should date largely to the late AD 1100s, but probably the bulk of it really is probably dating to the, uh, the 13th century, so the AD 1200s, which is also coincident with uh, in, in Mesa Verde uh, National Park and the surrounding area period of sort of peak occupation and cultural fluorescence in the region. Um, for that reason, we have a, a lot of really amazing archaeology that allows us to learn a, a great deal, a lot of really brilliant archaeologists to instruct really valuable lessons about um, how people made a living in the past. But not to press the issue too much, I do want to underscore how atypical this type of preservation is, and, and we can't underestimate it. Um, most people lose sight of the fact that a lot of perishable material culture makes up the vast majority of what people in traditional societies and what many of our ancestors across the globe used for tens of thousands of years. And in fact, where we actually have data from archeological sites where we have really phenomenal preservation, uh, upwards of 90% or more of the, the completed finished artifacts that survive are made out of wood, plant fiber. So baskets, textiles, worked wood. Uh, and that just attests to, to how much is not preserved in a lot of archeological contexts. So that means that there are some challenges when it comes to working with these archeological materials. Um, in some cases, you, you kind of have to work with what you have. In, in, case, in the case of some of the important sites that provide comparative data that help us contextualize Mesa Verde basket weaving in a regional context uh, and setting, we look to archaeological research that was conducted at Pueblo Benito and other sites in Chaco Canyon, as well as the, the Chaco and Outlier Aztec Ruin West um, in New Mexico. These sites have produced comparatively large assemblages uh, of well-preserved organic materials, but again, even within some of these sites, preservation can vary dramatically. Um, that impacts our ability to get data for what I'm trying to do from it, but also it can impact information that we learn about form and function. And so sort of setting aside some of the technical issues that I, I also get excited about um, and focusing more on some aspects of form and function and how these baskets were being used, I, I just want to you know, bear in mind that determining form and function for some of these objects is inherently problematic uh, with archeological materials in general, by and large, because sometimes we have direct indications. It's in the case of the, the basket fragments you see here where we are able to get some uh, analyses to help identify adherent residues. In some cases, we're relying on other multiple lines of evidence to make these inferences. And oftentimes when we, we feel confident and secure about something, it's because we have strong evidence to support that argument. Another important point, basketry is old. I'm sure some of you already knew this, but baskets, basketry technology have been around for a very, very long time. Uh, this is not the oldest basket from, from North America, uh, but it is certainly the, the oldest as yet, uh, coiled basket, so this type of basket technology from North America that bumps up at around 9,000 calendar years ago. And uh, this is again sort of helped to remind you that not only are, are the, the materials that you're getting to, to glimpse at with me and, and that we talk about are, are selective and representative of the sample that has survived, you're even getting a smaller sample because I'm tending to focus on the, the more of the wow pieces, the better preserved examples to help you sort of recreate and reconstruct your mind what it was like to, uh, to, to be a visitor to this past 
or, or these past and think about how people made their living using these items. So uh, we lack a full picture into the biases of preservation, but we, we do the best with what we have um, and we, we can learn a lot from them. What do I mean by basket? If I'm focusing on basketry so much here. Um, baskets are, in my understanding and, and my take is that they are, are technically a type of textile. Uh, the, the big difference is that they tend to occupy three-dimensional forms. They tend to employ more rigid materials, but otherwise they're fundamentally the same. Textiles and baskets in general rely on uh, structurally, more or less fundamentally the same basic structural techniques and technologies, even if there are variations in how they're created. And so for that reason, I tend to think of them as, as a, a branch or, or subclass of textiles. But suffice to say in North America, um, they go back uh, and, and certainly were with the, the earliest people to have arrived on the continent, even if we don't have direct evidence for it. And so with that, um, I want to say a little bit briefly about how we, we talk about defining these trends. How is it that we go from these fragments or sometimes complete baskets that I'm showing you pictures of to, to get at big picture ideas about the, the geographic affinities of the people that make these baskets? How is it that... that Ben or, or Lori or Ed or, or someone can look at one of these baskets and say, well, this looks like it came from this particular archaeological tradition, or this is similar to wares produced by contemporary Native Americans in this part of the country. Um, how do we do that uh, across these vast geographic distances as well as vast gulfs of time? Uh, and it boils down to what we've learned about the learning capacity of humans. Uh, in essence, it's humans' capacity for social learning and cultural transmission that allows us to make and, and, and strengthen our argument for, for some of these inferences that we draw. Baskets, textiles, sandals, related crafts, and, the, and their finished products reflect the decisions that are made during manufacture, right? These are decisions individuals make that are constrained by the combination of raw materials, artifact design, and culturally prescribed rules that dictate and govern behavior. So many of these crafts, uh, whether it be uh, basketry production, or textile production, or pottery production, these are things that people have traditionally learned at a young age, usually beginning around the age of six so that, that the, the young child has the adequate uh, neuromotor controls uh, and muscle control to be able to accomplish uh, dexterous uh, tasks requiring high manual dexterity is what I'm trying to say. Um, and uh, these can help guide and shape and lead to consistencies in uh, the technical choices that people make uh, during their production. They lead to regularities that we can observe in archaeological materials. Now, again, we're not saying that there's no room for innovation or, or adaptation or um, external influences, but rather that over the long term, uh, with sufficient data, we can, we can begin to detect uh, a signal, a, a sense of some of the patterns and artifact styles that reflect a history of, of a shared way of doing things. And uh, again, this is a product of the social learning process. So we can think about the finished object as in many ways embodying the culmination of generations of teaching and learning these crafts. And so with adequate data, we can start to, to pick apart and identify these patterns. But we also, I like to point out, are not just getting insights into stylistic production choices and how they vary through space and uh, uh, through uh, time and across space, but sometimes we can even draw insights and, and make observations about how people learned in the past. And what I love about this basket is it helps me illustrate this point very well. Um, this is uh, collected by uh, Plenier of Goddard, who is a ethnologist working on behalf of the American Museum of Natural History in New York. And what I draw your attention to is the, the, the skill and, and difference in, in quality of execution of the center of the basket. Now, for coil basketry productions, the, the starts or the centers are, are notorious for being among the most difficult to, to affect and accomplish. Um, it's hard sometimes, particularly with smaller hands that aren't as strong, to hold the, the fibers in a tight spiral and then, and then take the hole, uh, all and pierce it to make a hole, and sew the stitches. Um, so what you see here is what appears to have been uh, assistance, some, some collaboration in the learning process, which we see in, in some societies. And in this case, perhaps it was mom or grandma or an aunt uh, or a sister or, or, or something to that effect, uh, someone more experienced who helped make the start for them and then set them off to attempt to make their own plaque. And they did far better than, than I could have done and have done. Um, but what I love too is that you see some of the, the errors and some of the the choice and decisions that this young girl made and was having with uh, trouble with executing. 
So adding in new material for the foundation of the coil, uh, making sure the design was executed and balanced perfectly. Um, it's a really sort of, I think, sweet, humanized insight into what we do in archaeology. And when we're lucky, sometimes we get these archaeological examples like you see right here. Um, I, I interpret this as the, on the right as the work of a learner, in large part because um, it, it's not some haphazard work that was likely a, a product of someone who was delusional or, or suffering from uh, medical challenges. No, there are identifiable errors and, and uh, structural attributes of this object that tell me this was someone who had to have been learning because I've made the exact same mistakes in the exact same places. And so you see in this uh, unfinished plated ring basket, in essence, the ring baskets start out as these flat mats, that not only did this, this presumably young woman have problems being consistent in how she, she twined the sort of reinforcing edge to hold the strips, the yucca strips in place, um, but she also had a hard time keeping all the strips perfectly tight and compacted together. And in my effort some years ago, I, I similarly had these same exact issues with uh, that lack of experience, uh, that lack of sort of routinized muscle memory that allowed me to, to twine uh, quickly, efficiently, and properly, uh, as well as, as keep everything compact and tight. These types of, of insights into to the learning process tend to be rather rare. Um, and I, I had this example, not just because it's appropriate in the context of a discussion of Mesa Verde material, but also because there's another important component that we can't ignore. And it's a component to all of this, which I, I'm increasingly interested in for what it might be able to tell us about people's interactions with their environment. And that's the plants themselves. Uh, a lot of what you've seen here so far is include material that's largely made out of yucca, uh, as well as probably sumac and perhaps some willow. And uh, in, in the case for a lot of Southwestern basketry, it's a lot of sumac and willow, and of course, other plants that provide sort of the basic literal foundation for coil basketry, the, the rigid elements that go into a lot of basketry. When we talk about matting and, and some types of bags and containers, it might be uh, bulrush combs that are used to, to weave those. Yucca has an innumerable applications, whether you you'd be making string uh, or baskets or sandals or, or, or textiles in sort of the, the narrow sense. My point is that all of this plant-based knowledge is in and of itself an incredibly large body of knowledge for anybody to get a, a grasp on, to wrap their heads around. Consider that the people that are working with the plants that know these plants have to have detailed knowledge. It requires detailed knowledge about their ecologies, their, their growth habits, uh, their distributions on the landscape, seasonal availability, and also having awareness of the proper cultural protocol uh, for collection and processing of these plants. So suffice to say, there's a lot of work to be done before you actually weave anything. Uh, and what you see here are two sort of uh, different species of yucca. Uh, these are actually the, the photos that I had, which happen to be of, of yucca from Canyon de Chez. And uh, you see the, the variety of narrow leaf yucca and the broad leaf yucca. And we know from cross-cultural data that generally societies tend to prefer a, a rather limited subset of the, the suitable plants that are available uh, for a given society to use. Uh, so not surprisingly, given the, the increased or greater availability of broadleaf yucca uh, in the Mesa Verde vicinity, we see a lot more use of Mesa Verde, excuse me, a lot more use of broadleaf yucca at Mesa Verde than we do uh, in other sites where, such as at you know, Chaco Canyon sites where there's a, a whole lot more use of narrowleaf yucca species. But that also, my point is, translates into uh, not only collection difference in terms of perhaps if you want broadleaf yucca, how much higher in elevation you're going to have to hike and how you're going to treat it. Broadleaf yucca, the leaves, leaves tend to be a lot wider. Um, and so when we see them used in, in sometimes in baskets or in sandals, they have to split them lengthwise, longitudinally, to make them down uh, in, to fit in the narrow strips. In the case of narrowleaf yucca, uh, a lot of the narrowleaf yucca species have sort of a triangular ridge on the back of its leaves. Uh, and they are, are often and, and typically removed, uh, peeled away before using them in weaving. And so, again, there's this, this massive amount of knowledge that's embodied. So acquiring ample supplies of raw materials that also exhibit the necessary performance characteristics, both for, for preparing them and weaving them, requires not just knowing when and, and where to get it, but how to take care of it, how to management. Uh, and, 
that's a, a sort of a gentle uh, management and tending these plants to, to, to nudge them to grow in the most beneficial way, both for themselves and for us. And this is what ethnobotanists have referred to for years now as, as light hand management. And it entails things like tending, pruning, and coppicing of plants, things a lot of us, uh, even, even some people like me with a, a not very green thumb, unfortunately, uh, know something about that you can promote growth, you can sort of control the, the architecture of these plants as they grow uh, by tending them, by, by pruning them and, and, and cutting them back. Indigenous peoples have always known that this is a mutually beneficial relationship. We take care of the plants and they take care of us. Now, as I move to talk on more about what we can do with plants, it's fair to say that, you know, or rather almost ask the question, what can't you do with plants? And really not much it would seem. So what I'm gonna do in the time I have left is, is limit myself to, to focus on Mesa Verde, uh, the plated ring baskets, some a uh, little bit to say about twill plated matting, and then also uh, some more observations about coil basketry, which tends to be among the more abundant types of basketry that's preserved. This means no sandals this time. Uh, or what I prefer to think of as baskets worn on the feet, sorry. But I will here now publicly predict that Dr. Bellarado and I will probably have things to say about sandals, ideally together at, at some point in the future. We, we've spent a lot of time thus far talking about sandals, so I, I think uh, you can expect us to try and be invited back at some point. Now, one other point that I wanna make uh, that actually bears on this notion I've already introduced of a, of a tradition of Mesa Verde weaving, and it'll be the only remark I, I, I make now about the sandals, is one that's actually literally inscribed on the sole of the sandal that you're looking at. This is one sandal, you're looking at both surfaces, but if you look at the, the image on the right, it's the, the sole of the sandal. And in many types of, of weaving products, we, we talk about splices, and splices are the, the sites of, of insertion of new weaving materials. Uh, as existing elements or strips or stitches, as that material runs out, and are exhausted, they're of, of, of finite length. You have to replace them or supplement them, replenish them. On the vast majority of sandals made in this style, they're usually just sort of stacked one on top of the other, laid, laid there uh, in the sandal, re relatively easily to, to, to do and accomplish. And sometimes the butts, the base of the leaves are left on the sole for, for extra padding and they add some thickness. But I've only ever seen some of the uh, knotted splices, little overhand knots, hopefully, I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but hopefully you can make out some of the, they look almost like curly cues, uh, the remains of overhand knots on the soles of the sandal. This appears to be, in my experience, uh, a distinctively, uh, uniquely Mesa Verde treatment of splices on the soles of sandals. I only have ever seen it in these styles of sandals that come from Mesa Verde. Uh, and I think it sort of adds to this bigger idea of a, a, a discernible distinctive Mesa Verde tradition that I wanna talk about. So here we have another example of a, an unfinished ring basket uh, and with, alongside another more complete one from Mesa Verde. And uh, a lot of this material as you'll see is, is, comes from earlier collections that were made prior to uh, sort of development of modern standards and, and scientific excavation techniques. So uh, unfortunately, you're gonna see that a lot of these, we, we lack some important contextual information. Sometimes we don't know which Mesa Verde site, but we can pr be pretty sure that it was from Mesa Verde, uh, uh, the National Monument or, or vicinity. Uh, so there's some limitations in that regard. But we're also looking at here a, an example of a technology that at least prior to contemporary times, ring baskets were in some ways almost at their peak in geographic distribution across much of the Northern Southwest uh, during the, the 12th and 13th centuries, at least based on the number of examples that we have preserved in the archeological record. Um, because oftentimes they're, they're usually relatively numerous where preservation allows. Uh, they, they vary of course in, in their size, and execution. Um, some of them, many of them are often decorated. Sometimes it's affected by using dyed strips, so dyed yucca leaves uh, that, that are the elements passing over and under one another. In some cases, they are using uh, strips that pass over and under one another, but they, they kind of play around with the rhythm of that interlacement, of, of the, the rhythm of over and under passage. Whereas in the baskets that you see here, uh, they by and large appear to be um, a three, three, over three, under three. Uh, they're also altering that interval to create some of these, these structural patterns or designs, sort of the, the meander appearance of the image on the right, and then sort of the, the concentric or nested diamonds or squares on the left. In terms of size variations, um, usually they range in size about 12 to 40 centimeters in diameter, but depth varies. And presumably this is related with intended application 
orientation or function of the basket. Um, Carol Osborne, one of the first people to, to study in, in large quantities a lot of perishable material culture from Mesa Verde, noted that a lot of ancient specimens tended to be deeper than, than modern ones. Uh, and she suggests that this might be owing to differences in how they were used, that perhaps they were more for uh, multi-purpose containers used for storage in ancient times, whereas in, in more recent times among contemporary indigenous peoples of the Southwest, they're frequently used uh, for winnowing grains, but also for storage, uh, transporting salt, uh, you have it. I mean, they're, they're good serviceable containers that would meet multiple needs. So it's no surprise that they were used for a wide variety of tasks. They also must have been very clearly um, well loved. Some obviously come to us in virtually pristine condition. Others were put through the ringer and obviously very well loved. So this um, currently for me holds a title of, of most or well loved um, basket that I've yet to encounter. Um, it's a ring basket again from, from Mesa Verde that you, you see both the, the interior surface on the left uh, and the bottom or base on the right. Uh, I want to point out to you that not only is it heavily uh, mended, there are additional yucca strips that were added in a later date, some, some running stitches, but what some of these running stitches are actually sewing in are, are patches or, or mends to help hold the basket together. And in fact, what you see here are the remains of a sandal made out of yucca that have been sewn in as a patch and another fragment on the upper left uh, of, a, of a rush mat. So indeed a, a well-loved mat fragment, excuse me, uh, ring basket. One of the other interesting features that becomes a lot more common in ring baskets in the Southwest by the 1200s uh, and, and seems uh, particularly more preferred among some Mesa Verde ring baskets are the addition of these, these rim bands uh, as Morrison Berg called them. They appear at least in my interpretation seem to largely reflect more of an aesthetic choice more than a, than a functional one. Um, sometimes they can be quite elaborate. Sometimes they are added on. Sometimes they are uh, uh, integral or structurally necessary to the basket and were made when the basket was being uh, produced. And I, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that because I think it, it makes sense that they would proliferate when we see them in the archeological record. And a lot of that comes from some of the observation that we, we can make from looking at well-preserved matting. Uh, Tool-plated mats made out of bulrush are, are more or less ubiquitous in, in Chaco and, and Aztec collections as well uh, as a number of other sites, but not so much Mesa Verde. When we see mats in general, not just at Mesa Verde, but, but other sites, um, they use for floor co co coverings, um, burial wrappings, uh, sometimes storage containers and screens. We have a few examples of relatively complete ones and they appear to sort of range between about a meter to a meter and a half. Uh, aside, uh, sometimes they're even decorated using dyed strips or, or structural variations in how the, the elements interact with one another. But the, the interesting thing about Mesa Verde is that there are far fewer examples of these mats, however. Um, and it's striking given the excellent preservation at a lot of these sites that there aren't more in the collections. And so we, we're inclined to take this to mean that it's actually probably a real pattern that there aren't the mats preserved because if they were preserved, they would end up in these early collections and other excavations would have produced them. So then the question is, why so few mats? Well, we don't really know the answer, um, but it may be uh, related to the fact that, that there does appear to be a lot more hide working going on at Mesa Verde sites. And it may be that that is telling us something about the relative availability of hides and hide working, uh, or that you know these types of, of mats with the elaborate edge treatments that you see here, uh, were something that just people didn't spend a lot of time on. And for me, uh, first seeing the elaborate rim bands of those ring baskets, and when they show up on the scene archaeologically, some of these fancy rim treatments on mats show up earliest at Pueblo Benito when all of the Chaco stuff is starting to kick into high gear. And it, it really suggests um, that it might be a, an, an aesthetic addition, an embellishment added on to ring baskets, much in the same way we see these elaborate rims on or edges on these, these otherwise utilitarian mats. Uh, why we think that might be the case? Well, by and large, um, mats don't dis disappear from the archeological record, nor do ring baskets, which continue to be made among several Pueblo communities. But, you know, with, with some notable exceptions for ring baskets, the mats never after about 80, 1300 have those fancy rim treatments anymore. Coil bowls, coil baskets come in all forms and shapes and sizes bowls, trays of various sizes, various depths, some shallow, some uh, restricted openings, some wide mouth bowls. Um, decoration, uh, a wide range of variability. 
sometimes paint or pigment. A number of baskets that I've examined have evidence of, of red ochre, uh, a mineral pigment being smeared over their surface. Uh, a few of them use dyed or pigmented stitches, as you see on the lower left. Some were strikingly, and it becomes, a, again, another distinctive structural feature of Mesa Verde coil baskets, employ uh, turkey, que turkey feather quills as stitching elements. And in fact, the dark brown elements that you see in the basket in the upper left here are actually uh, turkey feather, split turkey feather quills that have been used for the decorative elements. Um, and there's some regularities in the, the overall design trends as well. Notice and, and draw attention to the, the sort of the overall patterns and layout of designs. You're gonna see some of these uh, repeated even if I don't call them out to you. Other options for, for decorative embellishment uh, amount to manipulations of the way that the stitches engage the coils. Uh, and these are other things that again, like this technique, which we call multiple stitch and wrap, tends to be something that prevails uh, in the Mesa Verde region as compared to a lot of others. These are probably two of the more um, elaborately decorated bowls uh, or vessels that I've seen from Mesa Verde. Uh, these two examples, we don't know anything sort of about their, their recovery context. Uh, it looks like they should have been found together given they're, they're more or less uh, siblings in, in terms of design, but we just don't really know based on the collection information. However, um, the shape and size, uh, are so similar, it would sort of suggest that they would have been uh, kept or perhaps stored together or the, the original collectors put them together. One uh, I will point out is, is has a design that is painted on, perhaps to mimic the, the other one, which actually has a design in which these stitches were, were sewn into the basket. Um, and one of the things that is really striking to me about coil basketry of this era for Mesa Verde is in terms of construction technology, how um, internally consistent is. That's not to say there's not a range of variation in, in how fine uh, and how even and consistent the texture of these coil baskets is at this time, but rather when I compare large numbers of Mesa Verde baskets to the baskets from Chaco Canyon or, or, or Canyon de Chez or Aztec Ruin or, or a few other places, Mesa Verde baskets are the most internally consistent. In fact, they're in some ways are almost more internally consistent being represented by multiple baskets from multiple different sites than some basket collections that come from individual sites like Antelope House and Canyon de Chez. Uh, some of that might be a function of time that's difficult for us to grasp, but um, one of the things that has struck me as interesting is that even when I look back at some of the earlier basket maker baskets that come from the Durango uh, Falls Creek rock shelters at the sort of the eastern margin of the Mesa Verde uh, cultural region, there are, are hints of, of technological consistencies that I think I see that are representative of these ancient connections to, to the groups of weavers and peoples that lived there uh, millennia earlier. And I, so I, I think that there, even when we look at some of the much older material, there's evidence that we can find to suggest that, that some of these practices, some of these choices and decisions that weavers are making as it comes to, to their baskets and how they produce them, are, are persisting over really, really long periods of time. And some of that might have to do with, again, how people are using them. Um, we, we don't have any obvious residues. Uh, in some cases that we do, they haven't been tested or analyzed. Other cases, it's clear these are related to food processing and preparation. Uh, a very small number of baskets show some evidence of, of scorching or charring on the interior. And this suggests that they were used uh, like, like parching trays for, for parching seeds and nuts. One of the other things that becomes real striking uh, in terms of thinking about sort of a, a distinctive Mesa Verde tradition and, and relationships with, with other sites is how similar after about AD 1130, the, the basketry at Aztec Ruin in Northwestern New Mexico becomes to sort of basketry from the core sort of central Mesa Verde area. Uh, indeed, so striking is the difference from, from what came earlier, which shares some similarity with, with baskets from Chaco Canyon sites like Pueblo Benito, that it has a, a very strong Mesa Verde feel to it. And you see that here in a, in a couple of side-by-side -side comparisons I had to show you. I don't take this and I don't, based on the weight of the evidence and, and, and my understanding of, of what I see in the, the basketry data, I don't take this to mean that Mesa Verde people have come and colonized Aztec after um, the, the Chaco regional system collapsed, but rather what we're, we're getting a glimpse of is increased connections and interaction, uh, one that implies much greater intensity. Uh, we see some changes, at least in what we have surviving of the, the basketry and textiles, 
of changes in sort of the execution of design, changes in the layouts um, are quite different. And the, the technologies change. They, they become in many uh, features more similar to, to Mesa Verde style bastion, which again, I don't think implies that uh, people are coming down to Mesa Verde and taking over, or excuse me, coming down from Mesa Verde and taking over, but rather that um, we're looking at a, a, a much stronger uh, connection and, and much more intense connection in that regard. Another thing too is that not just in the basketry, but those those sandals, um, uh, more of them start being made out of broadleaf yucca, which uh, again implies differences in how people are selecting and accessing raw materials. So there's subtle things like that. Uh, and we also see a, a spike or increase in the number of sort of these somewhat enigmatic baskets. They're little miniature plaques. Um, there are examples that appear to, to go back to at least the perhaps the 10 hundreds, maybe even earlier Pueblo Benito. Um, and we don't necessarily know what all they were, they were used for. Um, they increased in number quite significantly in Aztec after 80, uh, 1130, again, sort of consistent with, with what we see in some of the other evidence. Uh, and they're really common in Mesa Verde sandwiches where you get good preservation. Um, they have finished edges. You can see on both of these, the finished sort of what they call the false braid rim terminations on both edges. Uh, that implies they are actually finished objects. They're not unfinished baskets or, or test pieces. Um, some people have suggested they were used as pot covers. Some people as small trays. Um, Sometimes they show up and were clearly used as replacement, replacement bases for baskets. So you had a quill basket, the bottom broke out and you would replace it um, as might've been required in this case. Um, we just don't know, but uh, it seems likely that given the, the, the frequency in, uh, of, of their use in abundance that they might've had other more specialized applications. Uh, shields are not something we typically think of in, in terms of basketry, but one of the handful of known basketry shields that comes from the American Southwest comes from Cliff Palace uh, at Mesa Verde. Uh, and this particular basket is one of a handful of examples that we can identify based on sort of their overall size and shape. They are um, generally upwards of about 55, 60 centimeters in diameter. Um, so an approach to size that generally is too unwieldy uh, and, and problematic if you're gonna use them for winnowing or parching. Uh, you get a really wide basket that gets much wider than your shoulders. It gets really uncomfortable for the person winnowing and parching to use them effectively. So we're getting these really large baskets. Uh, they, they are consistent in how they're made. Uh, they show up in the 1200s, not just at Cliff Palace, but Mummy Cave in, in Canyon du uh, This is one of the, the more famous examples being used in, in a lot of sort of illustrations because of the, the painted or pigmented design. Uh, formerly, some of these not only had, had pigmented or painted decoration, but they also appear to have had, in some cases, handles and uh, strips of hide that had pierced the fabric that hung off of them, uh, sort of like uh, ornamentation. For a long time, I, I, I took it to be that these were perhaps probably not functional. I mean, could they really deflect or stop an arrow? Uh, and uh, maybe they were more symbols of, of status or badges of office that people held. And then I uncovered, uh, with Lori Webster working at the American Museum of Natural History, a shield that had uh, gone unnoticed in collections for, for decades and uh, very re readily identified as likely a shield. This one from White House uh, dating to the late uh, mid late AD 1100. So, so perhaps one of the earlier ones. Um, but this once for all dispelled any concerns I had about the shields being functional. Um, it, that it had uh, on the exterior surface, the tips of two wooden projectiles embedded in the fabric. So clearly um, not only were these serviceable, but they, they did indeed stop some of these projectiles. Um, that might be a future experimental archaeology project for someone, but I, I think I'm sufficiently convinced that it won't be me. Uh, a couple of other forms here is, as uh, we sort of move along and, and, and start trying to draw some things together. We see this sort of hourglass shaped tray form that shows up at a number of sites. Uh, there are a number from female burials at Pueblo Benito that also contain these um, so-called scraping tools made out of, of deer humeri. And uh, Carol Osborne marshaled a good bit of experimental evidence that more than likely they were yucca fiber processing tools, something that more than likely uh, women in the past would have been uh, spending a lot of time doing to produce a wide range of manufacturers. Where we see these types of baskets, and again, you see here, uh, I haven't examined it in person, it's on display, or at least it was uh, several years back at Mesa Verde. There's a couple of these examples of these. They're sometimes rectangular, sometimes they're hourglass or oval, or people even describe them as figure eight shaped baskets. They uh, appear to double both as uh, 
medicine baskets, so baskets that contain ritual or obviously ceremonial paraphernalia, as would appear to be the case of the Antelope House basket from Candy Duchet that had a, a painted uh, quadrupeds that included ground cornmeal that had been mixed into the pigment, as well as uh, the contents of the basket, which strongly suggested um, uh, ceremonial or, or, or spiritual applications. Others that we've observed in the archaeological record contain fiber processing equipment, spinning and weaving uh, tools for, for fiber and yarn, uh, and a number of them have again contained these so-called hide scrapers. So uh, evidence from Mesa Verde, it, it's there, but it's, it's sort of a little bit scant compared to other regions. We also have evidence in a number of these other sites, such as at, at Pueblo Benito and Aztec Ruin, uh, really unique clay-coated and painted basketry technology. This appears to be a, a very um, uh, important ritual technology. Uh, shows up very early at Pueblo Benito and occurs at Aztec uh, and a few other sites, but we don't have any in, in any of the really large substantive Mesa Verde collections from sort of the, the, the Mesa Verde, excuse me, the core Mesa Verde area, with the exception of some recent excavations uh, at sites uh, like the Wallace Ruin uh, under, under the direction of Bruce Bradley that has turned up a couple of small fragments from Chaco area deposits. So it's something that's intimately connected to the, the, the ritual goings on at Chaco and as they spread to Aztec where there are a number of examples. Um, but it's a notable absent, uh, absence from, from Mesa Verde assemblages uh, with a few exceptions of fragmentary remains that again come from Wallace Ruin. So there may well be more out there that we just don't have the evidence for. But again, the use contexts are strongly suggestive. We also have, as a sort of put in the, in the column of, of notable absence, as yet no evidence for cylinder baskets, the, the famous, uh, or, or I would say less famous, a fiber-based cousin to the ceramic cylinder vessels. Uh, most famous for the research conducted by um, Dr. Patricia Crown and, and Jeffrey Hurst to identify residues of, of cacao beverage consumption uh, and preparation. Uh, likely involved in important rituals at, at Pueblo Benito and, and elsewhere. The vast majority of ceramic vessels come from one room at, at Pueblo Benito and uh, most people aren't aware of the fact that there were actually uh, perhaps a dozen or more cylinder baskets and fragments that came from Pueblo Benito. Uh, they don't come from really anywhere else outside of Pueblo Benito that we know of, uh, but in, in, in all in, you know, visual appearances that count, they, they seem to be equivalents to the ceramic cylinder vessels, but none from Mesa Verde. The last sort of uh, real dynamic vessel form that I want to draw your attention to are the, the bifurcated burden, burden baskets. And this, this might be something for another future talk because um, I spent a lot of time talking with lots of different people and thinking about these. And, and um, I think there's a lot more to be said, but they're really kind of interesting and enigmatic. Um, they were very easily picked upon and recognized as burden baskets, that is straps, uh, uh, baskets that could be attached and worn with straps across the shoulders or head to carry burdens, uh, agricultural produce. Um, dirt or sod or firewood, things like that. Some of the earliest examples that we that we have that we think we had come from again, you know, ritual context apparently at Pueblo Benito, and this is one of those early examples from Pueblo Benito. The best preserved example as well from Pueblo Benito. A lot of the other ones are, are very well rotted. They persist and show up uh, at Chaco Canyon, but more or less appear in that sort of distinctive form that you saw by the 1200s. And in fact, where we start to see uh, showing up in, in the Cayenta region in Northeastern Arizona and, and conti contiguous regions are new sort of styles or variants of the, the bifurcated burden basket. And in these cases, they are obviously quite different in their shape. They're, they're obviously uh, younger. Um, and it appears that what this complex presumably uh, focused around fertility and agricultural uh, produce uh, and, and attendant ritual observances um, shifted geographically and became more important in, in Northeastern Arizona and adjacent areas. One of the striking things about these vessel forms is that they are so consistent, the ones that I've seen and how they're made, it almost suggests that there could have been specialists or a limited number of women that were making them. Which brings us to the one possible bifurcated basket that comes from Mesa Verde. It's actually poorly provenienced. It's in the, the National Museum of American Indian Collections. And um, it's just sort of enigmatic. It was sort of one of those things that you see and you're, wow, that's different. Um, a charitable interpretation might be that it's either completely unrelated, has some other function or purpose, or that someone saw a bifurcated basket, bird basket from further west and decided to copy it. 
Now, what are far more common are actually some of these uh, often fired, sometimes unfired ceramic clay effigies. These are some examples that you see from Pueblo Benito, um, sort of, again, attesting to the, the wider cultural importance of these types of, of burden baskets in uh, ancient Pueblo lifeways. We actually have some examples of these, even if we don't have the baskets themselves, there are examples of these that come from uh, the Haney site, uh, Cross Patch Ruin, Ida Jean, and Wallace Ruin. Uh, number of sites have produced one, a couple, as many as, as eight of these effigies, some of them of, of burden baskets, others of bifurcated baskets. What does this mean? Again, I think it, it's tied to a, a sort of a, a, a ritual observation shared among a, a group of people that uh, like a lot of sort of some of these ceremonial activities suggest are focused on community integration, bringing people together from diverse backgrounds uh, in ways that, that gets people focused on the care for not only uh, themselves, but their neighbors and the rest of the community. Um, and so there's a lot more that can be said about this, but I think it appropriate to sort of close out on some of the really amazing work that, that dovetails with, with a lot of the questions I've been raising that are being conducted by uh, Louis Garcia, Laura Webster and Christopher Lewis uh, as part of the Cedar Mesa Parishville Project. And um, since Lori introduced me to Chris Lewis, uh, we, we hit it off, talked frequently. I, he's my BFF. Uh, my basket friend forever. We spent a lot of time talking about baskets and plants, uh, and I'm incredibly grateful to him for, for being so uh, willing to, to share his knowledge uh, and also chat baskets with me. Um, one of the great things about the work that they've been doing, and I think really sort of helps set uh, the bar high and, and provides us with a model for how we can do projects uh, focused on organic material culture in the future, is to, to sort of model these projects like what, what they've been doing. Um, it, it acknowledges the contributions of uh, traditional technologists and experts, both in, in their crafts uh, and knowledgeable members of their communities, but also providing insights into the questions that I think resonate with not just archaeologists and other scientists, but a, a lot of indigenous peoples who have interest in, in bigger questions that don't just extend beyond um, the, the manufacture of the, the baskets, but how they, they tell us things about how people interacted. Uh, and these can be challenging because these are some of the times the, the less tangible aspects of the archaeological record that, that archaeologists and anthropologists are interested in. But I think it, it's a, a testament to our, our shared humanity that, that I think a lot of people find this interesting. Um, and uh, of course, we also get great insights when uh, someone like Chris puts their mind to replicating the rim of a basket, as you see here, one of those fancy plated ring basket rim bands that I, I don't think probably anybody else has seen or certainly been making them um, probably since the, the 1300s. Uh, Chris managed to sort of suss us out, work it out after looking at some in museum collections. I am admittedly jealous that this is a basket owned by Dr. Bellarado. He sometimes somehow got ahead of me in the line to, to uh, commission one from Chris to claim one, um, but I, I look forward to the chance to, to hold my own and uh, you know sort of take stock of, of how much we continue to learn uh, and how much more we still have to learn. Uh, I'm, I think I'm more or less out of time, but uh, some acknowledgments here. Uh, and of course, I, I'd be remiss if I did acknowledge the, the many basket weavers of Mesa Verde, uh, those, those peoples and their descendants. Uh, and also a, a special thank you to the late Carolyn Osborne, who did so much to preserve and document and help synthesize a lot of what we know about Mesa Verde organic material culture that um, a lot of what I and other people do really would not have been possible if not for, for some of her really important work. So with that, um, I'm, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you guys again so much for having me. Uh, this has been a lot of fun for me and uh, hopefully, hopefully we can do it again, but thank you very much. Great, well, that was fantastic, Ed. Um, wow. Um, so yeah, we do have a few questions. I was blown away. It's just incredible. incredible. Um, yes. Yeah, so one one question that uh, a few people asked, or something related to it, is: Can you maybe just talk a little bit more about what a ring basket is and what exactly that term is referring to? Sure. Yeah, I, I probably perhaps assumed uh, too much sort of. Uh, general knowledge. Uh, the ring basket, in essence, re refers to, uh, you've seen these baskets, they, they are obviously quite round in their shape, and what you see here in, in Chris's basket, I assume everybody can still see my screen, um, mm -hmm. they have uh, inside where after the, 
the, the basket is made sort of like a, a mat, um, almost like a placemat size mat. The, the leaves of the yucca plant are then folded over uh, a, a ring, uh, a rod. Usually uh, in a lot of Mesa Verde collections, in fact, they're oak, um, but you could use other plants, uh, sumac, for example. Uh, and they fold them over and then uh, bind and secure them over that, that, that rim rod. And so what you see in these uh, ring baskets is oftentimes they're, they're then bound and secured uh, once they've been folded with uh, a row of twining, which is a textile technique. And here, what they've done is if you see up here around the rim, there's the rim rod uh, that Chris has folded the yucca strips over and then interlace them to create that, that sort of fancy braid around the rim. So they're called ring baskets is sort of a, a generic term uh, for this type of basket that have been made for, for a couple thousand years and continue to be made at, at Hopi, Jemez, Zuni, Santo Domingo and, and other communities. Great, great. Um, so let's see here. Well, all of a sudden there's, there's only, there, there weren't as many and now there's more. Um, Let's see. So one question had to do with uh, similarities between Mesa Verde and basketry, or even more generally, the kind of northern southwest basket traditions and um, Mesoamerican basket weaving traditions. Are there are there specific or general similarities that you could speak to? Yeah, yeah. That that can, that can get into that can be a more complicated. Um, question to answer, but the, the, I guess the short of it, I were trying to answer that <laughs> briefly, it would be that if, if you step back sort of beyond the, the, the geographic and cultural boundaries of the American Southwest as an as a idea, uh, right, and you think more big picture about sort of uh, the distribution of, of textile and basketry techniques throughout uh, not just the American Southwest, but, you know, the, the Great Basin and California, uh, the Plains, all the way down into northern Mexico and Mesoamerica, there are certain techniques that are ubiquitous. Uh, one rod foundation baskets. Tool plated rush matting is super common uh, throughout the Southwest down into Mesoamerica. Um, the challenge is, is sort of picking up where some of those things are a product of really, really deep ancient connections or um, what we might think of as convergent evolution where multiple people in the past had the same great idea about how to use these plants uh, or is it implies some more ancient distant connection. There are aspects of some of these technologies that I, I think suggest some cross-pollination, uh, to use the, the plant metaphor, but uh, it's not something that would suggest sort of direct contact, but sort of down the line trade exchange of goods that were then copied or that the spreading of ideas that then uh, Pueblo peoples and their, their neighbors made their own. Um, so it's not wholesale exportation. The multiple stitched wrap um, that, that technique that I showed very, very early on um, where they do some wrapping of stitches to create patterns just out of stitches without dyes or pigments, that is something that, that I think has great antiquity um, as you go further and further south. And so, yeah, there's some tantalizing questions there, um, maybe for, maybe for the, the next talk, after our sandal talk. <laughs> I look forward to that for sure. Um, so, yeah, another question related to uh, gender. And, um, you know, do we know who, which gender may have made uh, basketry of different types or how would we get about that? And, and what do you think about that uh, yeah. about gender and baskets? That's a, a good question. And um, again, often with this stuff, there's so much I want to convey. And then there's also a lot of stuff to unpack. So when we, we start thinking about the sort of the gender roles in craft production, um, we have good cross-cultural data that suggests that there are certain types of activities, craft activities that tend to be male or female dominated. There are always exceptions. Um, so we, we don't want to overgeneralize, but uh, you know, in, in hunter-gatherer societies and in many small scale or so-called middle range societies, uh, you know, basketry production, textile production, they tend to be female dominated. Now, what that does is provide us with a useful starting point if we really don't have anything to go on. We can conjecture and speculate uh, and in essence, what we want to do is, is treat that as a hypothesis to be tested. And so I focus more on the, the likely contributions of women here, because on the one hand, um, it, it tended to have been a, a female dominated craft uh, among most groups of the American Southwest in more recent times, but also um, because we have the association in burials of tools used to make baskets. So all sometimes baskets themselves, 
sometimes unfinished baskets, things like that that are found uh, with burials where the, the sex can be determined or we can make an argument for a gender role. And so in that case, the archeological evidence really tends to support uh, an assignment of, of sort of being female dominated. Were there male gendered basket weavers? Yeah, of course. Um, but you know, in general, those are the big patterns that we observe. Um, and obviously what then become the really interesting questions to me, I think are, you know, in, in how do you come to understand and explain situations like uh, among many Pueblo communities where, where men are the weavers or what are the explanations? How do we understand that? Because it, it stands in contrast to some other societies on the planet uh, where, it, you know, textile production is such a, a female dominated craft. So all sorts of interesting questions that again, come back to bigger questions about human diversity. Oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah, I, I often think about that. Um, I got to travel with Louis, Earth Louis and, and Chris to Oaxaca and the, the backstrap loom weavers in, in Oaxaca were almost exclusively women. And, um, and then in the Southwest, uh, uh, a lot of uh, men did the backstrap weaving. Um, and and uh, so that was a really interesting kind of interchange uh, between those folks when they were talking. But um, so let's see, another question, and we'll just probably have time for one or two more. I don't wanna keep you too long and we're, we're getting near the end of our time, but um, let's see here. Um, oh, so is there any difference, um, broadly speaking, between the materials that people used in ancient times for basketry versus what they used uh, in modern day? Um, that's, a, that's a really interesting question. Uh, so the short answer is that on one level, no, but with some caveats, with some, some uh, you know, certain of these plants, like sumac, willow, yucca, they've been used, you know, in essence forever. Um, but there are a lot of other plants that sometimes show up in, in early anthropological documents or, or colonial documents, um, and they might record a plant that, that maybe people today don't remember using or isn't represented in the archaeological record. So, we have to be careful and critical in how we examine the historical documents, the ethnographic record. Um, I think one of the things that I've learned and certainly from, from, from chatting with Chris and, and talking about plants and collecting plants, going out there and, and, and doing this, you can't, I don't think you can work with plants and not, once you start doing that, start grabbing everything you see and seeing if it works to make a basket or if it works as a fiber plant of some sort. It's it's, it's almost become a problem, my wife tells me. Um, you, you, you can't stop trying new plants out. I get bundles of plants or whatever because, well, I'm gonna soak this after it dries and see if it works for, for what have you. Um, so I, I think there's a lot more information about plants that, that people use that we've lost that just hasn't been preserved or, or is, remains dormant. Um, and so the exciting thing for me is to, to do some of this, somewhat of experimental archeology span and, and try and maybe recover some of these plants. Because what it does is if we find that they're suitable or we observe people use them now and it wasn't recorded, it's an invitation to, to, to evaluate this and assess this in the archeological record. Uh, and inevitably when we do that, we find surprises that we feel like we shouldn't be surprised by. That's great. Yeah, yeah, you have to be careful with yucca. I found out in the last couple of years, um, soaking it uh, before or after you boil it, if you let it sit too long, it gets really, really smelly. Um, <laughs> so that would have been something you want to keep outside of your house. Um, yes. Really mind-boggling discovery. Um, so uh, <laughs> let's see here. Mm -hmm. um, well, so you showed a picture of, of, of a very old basket. Is that um, the oldest basket that we have from say the Southwest or the region, or where do you see the oldest baskets or other textiles um, that have been recovered? And, and what can you tell us a little bit about those? Um, the oldest sort of bona fide baskets, I, I think there, there are some fragments of things that may be baskets or mats that come from some of the, the Paisley Caves in South Central Oregon, uh, where uh, Dennis Jenkins and Tom Connolly and their colleagues have been working. Uh, where they got the the you know over fourteen thousand year old uh, human coprolite that that yielded DNA evidence. So uh, there's some early suggestions, but I think by and large the best strongest evidence for really sophisticated technologies comes from Spirit Cave, Nevada. Some of the the burial accompaniments, um, bags holding cremations as well as as matting. 
uh, that suggest a really well-developed ancient textile uh, technology and, and tradition that was established, you know, over 10,500 years ago. Um, some of the material I worked with from Gitaro Cave in the highlands of Peru uh, go back over 11,000 years old. Um, so, it, you know, what we have good evidence for is sometimes indirect for really early evidence. Um, you know, they, they now have really strong evidence for Neanderthal string production. Um, you know, it's just gonna be a matter of time before we, we come up with, with the necessary data or there's a new discovery uh, that pushes this stuff back further and further. But um, this, the, the cowboy cave basket is the oldest coil basket yet dated. Uh, is it the first? No, we, we will probably unlikely ever find the very first one, but um, this gives us a, a good handle of, of just how early these technologies are. Wow, that's amazing. Wow. Huh, yeah, it just really, you know, makes you think about the longevity of basketry tradition just among humans and um, how this is something that really you know, ties us all, weaves us all together um, as, as, a, as, a, as a species. Um, so I guess maybe we'll ask one more, if that's okay. Just one last question. Um, I'd be remiss and I'd probably get a, um, a tongue lashing if I, I didn't ask our, our postdoctoral scholar, Michelle Turner here at Crow Canyon that's doing some great work with us. Um, asked about a little bit about the oval baskets, the hourglass shaped baskets. And if we have, um, you know, basically for how long were those in use or made for And Based on the evidence that we have, is it just the Pueblo two and three times or is it a longer time frame? Um, I would say, I mean, what makes them so distinctive is, is their shape, um, uh, that, that they're this sort of rectangular shape. And so you need to be able to, to discern that you need certain sections of the wall that preserve to make it really confident, which occasionally happens. Uh, I identified one from Aztec uh, from a burial that was heavily fragmented, but uh, enough of the, the corners were preserved that I'm like, okay, this had to, this could only have been one thing um, and, and a few other sites. So they're, they're probably earliest uh, from Pueblo Benito, at least as far as we know, again, dating to sometime in the, the probably the mid 10 hundreds, maybe a little bit later, maybe a little bit earlier. Um, but those would be the earliest, you know, demonstrable baskets of this type in the Southwest. However, I should say that, um, and it's actually more interesting, again, coming to this big question about Mesoamerica and these, these regional patterns, there are baskets that are largely similar in form that are rectangular, but sometimes made uh, in sort of the plating technique. Uh, the Rara Muri in Northern Mexico, uh, a number of indigenous groups throughout Mesoamerica, the Aztec uh, and other groups, all the way down into the Andes of South America have both uh, women's work baskets for fiber related arts and crafts, and uh, sometimes these ceremonial or, or medicine baskets that conform in, in broad terms to this sort of rectangular or oval shape. So is there something deeper going on there? Or maybe it's just that a, a nice rectangular basket is perfect for holding your, your spindles and process fiber. I, I suspect if I had one, I would, I would do the same thing. Um, but uh, lots of interesting questions uh, in, in that regard, and, and maybe we'll get some surprises in the future. Great, great. Well, I think we're just about out of time, Ed. So um, I just want to, again, thank you so much for giving this great presentation uh, uh, to us. And uh, we had a a huge number of, uh, of viewers as you went along. So um, we're really getting your message out um, and to talk about your research. So thank you so much again. I wanna give just a quick little plug to um, uh, at Crow Canyon, we're gonna be offering a, uh, a Navajo basket weaving workshop. You know, it's, it's a different tradition than you've really been talking about, but a um, uh, very important technology on June um, 5th to 12th. Um, and I think that's going to be online, but try to tune into that. And then, of course, um, we have several, you know, every week we have another webinar uh, for the foreseeable future for the rest of the year, really. So please try to tune into those. Uh, and of course, if you have any questions about any of the material that uh, Dr. Jolie presented this evening, you can uh, email either email him or you can email us at Crow Canyon and we can pass along the questions to him. So, um, Thank you again very much, Ed. It was, it was great talking to you. And, My um, pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, you we'll all take, talk to you later. Take care. Thank you.